Uh, and um, I hope all of you got the assignment email and all that. So you know that there's an assignment up and it's due sometime soon. Um, and I also hope that you have started working on the assignment. Um, I had suggested a couple of uh, problems first, which uh, really are uh, classical transport where electron is where the electron is experiencing you know, uh, electric and magnetic fields. And you've got to track its motion. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, s s see uh, how sometimes uh, it, these fields can lead to rather somewhat non-trivial effects. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, I had a few problems to uh, you know, practice or revise a little bit of the uh, quantum. We are going to uh, start uh, spending quite a bit of time starting today uh, developing notions of uh, quantum mechanical, uh, um, you know, quantum mechanics of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, charged particles. We're going to start that today, but I also hope that you have had some uh, um, opportunities to revise and uh, I had also posted some uh, information from previous courses so if you can w look at the materials and uh, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, spend some time trying to get back if you are done uh, quantum some time ago just to get a get back to the uh, flow of things in quantum okay so uh, so please uh, uh, if you uh, have uh, not yet uh, managed to get here uh, the sooner you are uh, able to start, the better it is for this course. Uh, uh, and I will, uh, today I'll uh, talk, um, kind of do a recap of uh, most of the quantum that's necessary uh, for the course, uh, the, at least the initial part of the course. And then uh, in the course, we are also going to uh, develop some notions that, that uh, uh, transport properties have introduced into quantum mechanics itself. You know, so, uh, so there is kind of a, a give and take. Uh, so uh, w one of the problems here is kind of a, if you have done any quantum course, you would have uh, done these problems, uh, you know, kind of a stationary state problems, finding the allowed energies, allowed wave functions for electrons in, uh, in a particle in a box situation, a harmonic oscillator, hydrogen atom. Uh, and today I want to kind of give uh, um, or hopefully I develop an intuitive feel for all of these, uh, you know, how, how does one go about uh, getting these uh, quantities. Now these are what are called exactly solved problems in quantum mechanics. There are very few exactly solved problems in quantum mechanics. Uh, this, is, this is a partial list, probably there are two or three more, you know, and, and they are the only exactly solved problems. The others are exactly solved as in analytically, uh, you know, you, you have a formula, analytical formula for the for the uh, solution for the uh, uh, problems here. Uh, you don't need to know all this stuff to solve the next two problems. And that's, that's uh, uh, something I wanted to add. Uh, the next two problems here uh, uh, are very similar if you have taken any electromagnetic course. Uh, it's just to introduce you to the notion that the motion of electrons can also be thought of as motion of light in waveguides or you know, of waves. Uh, or water waves in a, uh, along the shore of a, uh, you know, of an ocean. It's very similar. So, uh, just like you do that for, uh, for example, for light for solar cells, you can coat it with a very thin layer of material that is called an anti-reflection coating. It won't let the wave bounce back. It will, and, and the same thing for, as you can imagine, for particles, you wouldn't do that really. You know, if you're throwing a ball at a wall, and you want the ball to go through. You don't put another wall in the front, but actually, if it's a wave, you do, you know, and it works. So, so uh, these are some notions that, uh, uh, for example, this problem is an anti-reflection coating problem, but for electron transport. And the last problem is an interesting problem. Uh, uh, I'm not saying it's an easy problem, but give it a try and see see what you get here. It's a very interesting problem, and I will uh, try to give you a little hint today as we discuss. Uh, how uh, you might go about solving it. I want to see what you do in this problem. And I, 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 I have a solution, but I don't think that's the only solution. I've heard this problem from many uh, uh, different uh, sources, and uh, 
and different interpretations see what you what you what you can make of it you know, so um, so <clears throat> okay um, so let's uh, uh, get uh, going with the uh, what I wanted to do was uh, you know, um, do a recap of, of quantum and uh, to do that uh, we'll start with a recap of uh, again classical mechanics and then then uh, uh, show uh, you know how it uh, you know how, how what we'll end up with in the end uh, when we do a full quantum version of it so this is essentially classical mechanics saying that if I have a have a mass m uh, sitting here with a at a location x and going with a momentum p we are going talking about one dimension here in this example uh, classical mechanics says that i can precisely define where it is and how fast is this particle moving so uh, you know uh, velocity times mass is the momentum so i can precisely define that point in phase space or momentum space uh, location uh, space and then, uh, uh, based on all the sum total of all forces that act on this particle, I can completely determine its future, you know, and and, and determine its transport properties, where it will be, uh, you know, a millisecond later or you know a light year later. It's the same deal, and I can determine it completely. You know? So, so that's classical mechanics, right? And uh, uh, for charged particles, uh, the forces that act on it are the Lorentz force, the electric and the uh, electric field times the charge of the particle plus velocity cross product with magnetic field. So the second term is going to, the first term we are generally very well you know, acquainted with. The second term we are also acquainted with if you're doing, uh, you know, if you're involved in some sort of research, but we'll see later on it will lead to some very interesting effects uh, 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 in, 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 in the um, you know, such as, uh, well, first of all, it leads to Hall effect, but then it will see, lead to quantum Hall effect, anomalous velocities, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of interesting things there. Okay, uh, okay so um, now uh, one of the motivations for quantum, which we also kind of had just about started talking about in the last class, is uh, uh, from a great deal of experiments. Uh, um, people uh, realize some very strange things about, uh, um, you know, uh, particles with very small mass, such as an electron. That will be our, you know, uh, major topic of discussion: the electron itself. And uh, uh, let's kind of uh, motivate it from a, uh, another cl uh, classical transport problem: that uh, if I, uh, if I have, a, um, let's say, I, I, I have a you know, uh, a heavy star, okay, and then you shoot a planet, you know, towards the star, right? That's an example, right? Shoot the planet towards the star and, uh, and say, and ask the question, well, how far from the star will the planet, you know, come to stable orbit? And that's a classical mechanics problem, and you can solve it. It was solved. That's how we, you know, uh, understand that uh, because of a, let's say, a you know, massive star, uh, there's a gravitational field, and the potential due to the field, uh, due to the, you know, gravitational pull is, is uh, uh, you know, we, we can write it as gm over r or something like that, right? One over r, right? The, the uh, attractive force is one over r squared, the potential is one over r, right? You can see the analogy to a proton and an electron here very soon, right? So. And you shoot it, and then uh, uh, if you plot this around the, uh, you know, when, uh, around the uh, massive object here, it looks something like this, right? It'll look something like that, one over r on both sides, and that's r is equal to zero. And uh, uh, if it comes in with a certain energy, let's say E is the energy, total energy, you know, very far from the gravitational uh, you know, field of the star, it was half mv squared. You know, it was moving, we shot it with some velocity, right? Towards this planet, right? And, and then it comes in there, and I think you know that uh, there'll be a, uh, it has that energy, and, and uh, you know, at, it, it will kind of come to a stable orbit at a certain distance, you know, with a stable r, right? And then, then it will rotate that around there, right? And so that has a, 
this total energy, therefore, will be you know, the sum of the two, and uh, this will be a total energy, and it will be fixed, and it will kind of stay there forever if there are no dissipative forces anymore, and that has become a planet. You can create planets this way, right? Or you create satellites if you want, and that's what we do with geosynchronous and all that satellites, right? So now uh, we take the same problem and say we do this for the electron now, okay? And so remember, this is a it's a unique energy now, which is kind of stuck there. And we do the same problem, but for the electron now. And uh, so E minus is our notation for an electron. And and what we have. Here is a proton, uh, and this is the model of the hydrogen atom, right? So it's an electron, shoot it. And then uh, uh, here, the potential. Obviously, there's also a gravitational attraction between the electron and the proton. But we know that the Coulomb attraction is like 10 to the power 40 times stronger than the gravitational. And it's way, way stronger, the Coulomb interaction. Therefore, I mean, you can also include the gravitational force, but we will kind of neglect that and write it as minus Q with the electron charge or the proton charge, which is the same, over 4 pi dielectric constant divided you know, by R. This is the Coulomb force or the electrostatic uh, potential uh, uh, attraction between, between the electron and the proton. So this is, again, a, a, a way you can think of it as also as a transport problem, where the, you're trying to shoot the electron and then see where does it land, you know, at what energy does it uh, end up, and things like that, right? So uh, now, um, by the same analogy, it will end up somewhere here, right? And let's just draw that, you know, it will end up somewhere here. And so it will have some energy, right? Let's call it E1 for now. Right? Uh, and uh, now this is. Uh, we, we experimentally, what we find is uh, here I can kind of you know shoot uh, many masses with uh, different velocities and they end up at different energies. So you can have a continuum of energies, except if you have this in a particle in a you know in a atomic situation where you have electrons and protons, what is found experimentally is there are only fixed orbits. There aren't a continuum of orbits. There are, the orbits are not, you know, uh, or any radius or any energy. They're only fixed. And experimentally, this was discovered. Uh, way be I mean, this was one of the motivations also for quantum mechanics uh, that uh, the energies of the electron. That's you know, you can think of it as you know, moving around or its transport. It's circling around the nucleus or the proton, but it can have only fixed energies. This is what experimentally found. And how did people find it experimentally? So anybody help me here. Experimentally that these had you know, discrete energies. Yeah. Say, say that again. Very good. Thanks, uh, Nima. Thanks. Uh, so yes, so this is from spectroscopy, right? If you take hydrogen gas and you bombard it with light, and you see what comes out, uh, what comes out is not uh, a you know a continuum of let's write this as h nu, which is Planck's constant times the frequency of light, which is equivalent to h bar omega. These are notations we are also kind of setting for the course now. Uh, h is Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the power minus 34 joule second, and h bar is just Planck's constant over 2 pi. Uh, Omega, as you can imagine, is uh, you know uh, two pi times the frequency, a circular frequency, right? So it's the same thing, right? So frequency is in one over second or hertz or terahertz. Omega is in radians per second or cycles per second, right? So yeah. Okay. So uh, so experimentally, what people observe is if you excite this you know uh, atom or a collection of such similar atoms with a broadband source of light you know, with lots of energies, and you, uh, uh, essentially what you're doing is if there's an electron sitting in this orbit, you shoot it up to that orbit, and then you wait a little bit, and it relaxes, and it emits a photon, it emits another light, right? So similarly, maybe from here to there, and it emits another, right? And, and uh, uh, if it was a classical situation now, you might have, you know, expected a, 
uh, of continuum of photon energies, but what is experimentally observed is a very sharp lines, right? So you see, uh, you know, very very sharp lines, uh, and these energies, uh, you can write it as uh, E. Let's you know uh, label it as M N and all that. So you can say E M minus E N is H bar omega M sub you know M N, which is the difference of these uh, energies. Okay, so, so this is what experimentally was observed, and you can take a hydrogen atom, do this. You can take a quantum dot, you can take a quantum well, anything you do, you do that, you'll, you'll see sim similar things. In a semiconductor quantum well, you can artificially design quantized structures, we'll show that. Uh, and then the question was, now why is this happening, right? Why is that uh, the uh, energies are quantized? Uh, so what was um, the reason for that? which was kind of not quite you know known here it's also true here except you know that effect is so small that you can neglect it except here it becomes very very you know uh, prominent and what what effect is that now what effect of this you know uh, of an electron moving around a proton becomes hard to neglect compared to a you know earth moving around the sun yeah that's exactly right. So it's the wave nature of the electron, the fact that electrons also have associated with them a wavelength, right? And, and when it goes into an orbit, uh, it must satisfy, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to develop this a little intuitively, so, you know, I'm, I'm underst I, I ho uh, the, the, for, the, for the math and all, we are going to do that, but at least initially we're doing it intuitively. So if it has a wavelength, you can imagine it must have an integer number of wavelengths to complete a circle, right? I mean, otherwise there's mismatch. You know, so. so it must fit an integer number of wavelengths. And, and therefore, uh, uh, and, and that's where the, you know, the fact that it, has, it is an integer number of wavelengths immediately tells you that it must be discrete. So maybe a half wavelength here. Uh, in, in terms of a particle in a box problem, which we will you know, uh, use extensively in this course, if I have a uh, you know, particle in a box where, uh, you know, so I'll have a ground state, I'll have an excited state, and all that we do there is, is uh, understand that an electron, uh, if it has a wavelength, it can fit something like that, you know, a half wavelength in the size of the box, uh, a full wavelength, and, you know, maybe three quarters of a wavelength, and so on, right? So, so it can only fit an integer number, and as a result, the uh, energies will also become quantized, and that's what something we're going to kind of uh, show that now, right? So this is, and I think you uh, probably have read about. So historically, you know, Niels Bohr uh, came al came along with a quantization condition, uh, which was uh, you know initially ad hoc, trying to uh, you know explain the hydrogen uh, atom spectrum. Uh, so this is the intensity of light uh, that is. Uh, you know, um, emitted by by by, by the uh, electrons in an atom, and and what's very interesting is it only makes discrete jumps. It you know, uh, and and it, it there are no intermediate stages. It's, it makes discrete jumps. So, so. Uh, now, uh, since we are discussing this, let's uh, write down a few things about uh, the electron uh, and its energy and its you know some of the notations we are going to use uh, in in this in this class. Uh, so. Because uh, we are saying it has a certain wavelength, uh, we can um, <coughs> uh, we can define uh, something called the wave vector. Uh, this is again from electromagnetic theory. If you know the wavelength of a wave, then two pi by the wavelength is what we're going to call as the wave vector with units of one over length, right? And in many things we are going to do in this course, the wavelengths of electrons would be of the order of you know. Uh, microns or nanometers, and so your k's will be of the order of inverse nanometer or inverse microns, so of the order. Right? So, uh, of course, you can have electrons in, uh, you know, if you're using a SEM or a vacuum system, you can have meters, you know, and you can have very low energy electrons with very long wavelengths. Uh, but inside solids, we are talking about typically microns or, you know, m nanometers in wavelength, typically. You know. uh, uh, the uh, okay, so uh, 
so that's that's one uh, you know aspect of uh, classical mechanics versus quantum mechanics of you know particles. Right? So so and then except that here we must encounter the we must uh, include the fact that these are waves. In fact, it's also a wave here, but you can calculate the wavelength. You know, it will be extremely small compared to the size of the orbit. Right? And what is the wavelength of a particle? Uh, again, this is something you probably know very well. How do I find the wavelength of a particle, of a, something that has mass? Yeah. Yeah, so the de, de Broglie relation, uh, that tells you, <coughs> right? Uh, what does it tell you? What is the wavelength of a particle you know, that has a certain velocity, mass, and mass. Right? A2. Right. So it's very simple. Uh, Planck's constant over the momentum, right? Uh, that's the uh, de, Broglie, de Broglie relation. Wavelength is Planck's constant over the momentum of the particle. Now, the momentum of the particle uh, is. Uh, is uh, given by mass times velocity, but uh, for now, that's OK. A little later in the course, we are going to have to uh, understand that there is also a little term here which looks like this. Uh, it's a relativistic quantity. This is the relativistic momentum of a particle. Mass times velocity for very slow moving particles is just mass times velocity. For velocities that are approaching speed of light, you get this thing here, you know, one over one minus, uh, you know, the uh, relativistic factor there. Right? So, now this is very general. Uh, it is uh, true for uh, all kinds of particles, not necessarily just electrons, but you know, all kinds of particles. So, yeah. Now, uh, okay. So, any questions here? I, I, I'm kind of uh, moving forward uh, now. So, and, and again, now you can go here and in the last class we talked about things like velocities of uh, say 10 to the power, you know, uh, 7 centimeters per second for saturation velocity of an electron. You can plug in values here and find out what will be the order of magnitude of a momentum, uh, you know, as defined by uh, uh, this quantity and then find out the wavelength of those electrons. You know, so you can kind of give, get estimates of these very quick. Okay. Okay, so uh, I, what I want to do is uh, now uh, start also, uh, this is something I've used uh, again uh, in earlier uh, you know, discourses of this class. But uh, so the fact that a particle has a wave nature is uh, one aspect of quantum mechanics. Uh, here's the other aspect of quantum mechanics, and this is kind of the weirder part of it. Uh, but you know, they are related uh, in some sense. Uh, this is the classic two, double slit experiment where you have a, you know, a laser and you have two slits and then you have an array of detectors here and you are shooting the laser and uh, observing you know, how many photons hit this detector, how many that detector and you make you know, a histogram of how many hit any detector and you get this classic wave pattern. Right? It's a double slit experiment. You can write down the, the uh, relation for uh, interference of, of a you know of a light wave going this way or that way. There's a slight path length difference, and that difference is uh, an integer number of wavelengths. So you know whenever whenever it's an integer number of wavelengths, you get a peak. Whenever the mismatch, you get a trough, and so on. Right. So so this is a, a classic interference pattern in indicating a wave. So that's uh, there's nothing surprising about this. This is you know also happens for water waves in a shore and all that. But uh, what is interesting or what is uh, weird about quantum aspect of it is when you completely tune down the intensity of light and go to just one photon, just one, and then you shoot it through the double slit, and then you get only one of this, clearly only one of this will you know, uh, detect it, only one detector, right? And, and the thing is, in that one experiment, uh, uh, you can't say now whether that's a particular wave. When you do this experiment, only one of them clicks, meaning even though the photon is a wave that's presumably spread out in space, all of it collapses into one, one detector. And all the energy goes into one detector. So it's acting as if it's a particle, right? It's all its 
information, uh, uh, everything is concentrated at one point by the time you, you know, uh, uh, detect it. So this is the somewhat a stranger part about quantum. Uh, and then you can do this experiment again, and then maybe another detector comes on and, uh, again. And if you do it a million times and you draw the histogram, you'll recover this again. Right. So, so this is the uh, you know, wave particle duality. It's not just that the electrons are behaving as if they have wavelength. Photons are also behaving as if they are particles, as, as you know, all their uh, energy is getting absorbed in one detector here. And then when you do this with electrons, uh, classically you wouldn't expect this. Classically you would expect that if I shoot with an electron gun, if I shoot, I'll get a blob here and I'll get a blob here. And basically I'll get a two-peak situation for electrons, right? And that would be true if these two, dist you know, the, if the wavelength of the electron was very different from the spacing. But once the wavelength becomes of the order of the spacing, then you get a diffraction pattern also for the electrons. Right? So, uh, okay, so so uh, uh, so that you get a wave, and this is really something that uh, you can observe uh, in experiments. I mean, we we actually in our lab do it all the time. Uh, we have an electron gun. Uh, we're growing a crystal, a crystal, a semiconductor crystal with periodic arrangement of atoms, each dot being an atom here. And when the electron bounces off this periodic grating, which is kind of this grating, you can see the diffraction spots here. And I can see it. And we actually use it in, in our labs to track you know, how many la atomic layers we're putting down and all that. This is used uh, every day uh, tool. Uh, this was one of the pioneering experiments in uh, late 1920s, early 1930s by Davison and Germer. Uh, uh, to verify a de Broglie relation, the fact that you know uh, you can you can get so this spacing is related to the wavelength of the electron itself, so you can uh, detect that. So it's it's very real, uh, uh, and uh, and then and then and it's it's actually used for uh, 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 you know routine since, you know growth of crystals and that sort of thing, and and it follows this relation very accurately. You can increase. If you want to increase the wavelength, or if you want to decrease the wavelength of the electron, you increase its momentum, or you increase its kinetic energy. Typically, what you do is increase the voltage between your electron gun and, and uh, you know, uh, another source here. You, if you increase the energy of the electron, the wavelength becomes shorter and shorter. And therefore, you can estimate that if your atomic spacing is a couple of angstroms, then you need maybe an electron energy of 10 kilovolts in order that the wavelength becomes short enough that it diffracts. You know, can, if you're way off, it will not diffract. You'll see a little haze, like a classical you know, uh, blobs, as you might imagine. So, OK. Uh, OK, so uh, now given that uh, the electron is behaving, uh, by the way, any questions here? Please stop me whenever I have any specific questions. Right. If not. Uh, so what we uh, said uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, what, what I want to do today is really uh, build up the analysis of the uh, electron and, and, uh, uh, and, and kind of have a, uh, develop an intuitive notion of the wave function of the electron and then how we can use it to extract uh, uh, the quantities of interest to us like the momentum, uh, like the uh, energy uh, and then Towards the end, I want to uh, finish up today with uh, uh, the fact that uh, you know there are the electrons by themselves are fermions. They you can't put two of them in a single state in the same state. Uh, whereas photons or phonons are bosons, we can put as many of them in the same state, and all of that also comes from quantum. So we'll try to get to that point today. Okay, but before we get there, I want to you know kind of write down a relation which uh, uh, we kind of l leap forward a little bit and uh, write that uh, in classical mechanics, we wrote that the force is of, of uh, that a charge experiences is uh, uh, due to electric field and due to, uh, uh, you know, V cross the magnetic field. Right? That's the Lorentz force. And what we'll see by the time we're done, this may take till maybe the next class or something like that. But uh, by the time we're done, the full quantum version of it is actually very interesting. Uh, I can 
you know, right force as the rate of change of momentum, there's no problem with that. And I'm going to skip for now the, you know, vectors and all that. We understand it. You know? Rate of change of momentum is force. Uh, and I'll write this as, you know, Q times E. E is the electric field. Uh, I think if you have solved any electromagnetic problems or things like that, many times instead of electric field, you use the electric potential, just like we were, you know, gravitational potential and electric potential here. Many times we use that. How is the field related to the potential? Is the gradient or the spatial derivative, right? d by dx or d by dr, you know, gradient, right? So I can write the, you know, force as and it's the negative, as you said, because the force always go, pulls you towards the lower part of the gradient, meaning to the, the minimum of the potential, minus the gradient. And I'll write this gradient, uh, you know, instead of d by dx as gradient sub r, you know, del sub r. That's d by dx, but in three dimensions, right? So, right? Uh, <coughs> del by del x plus y, you know, del by del y plus z, del by del z. Right, that's the gradient, and uh, in this course, many times I'll skip all these del over del x. I'll write it as just del sub x. It's understood, right? Del sub x. It's just e economical expressions, plus y del y z del z, right? Okay. So gradient x. So that's the notation we're going to use. I'm going to just erase it now, and write the potential as phi. You can use v. Phi, you know, whichever way you are comfortable with uh, potential, it has units of phi will be what? Uh, sorry, yeah. Will be energy, right? Joules, right? The way it's written, Q times E. So it's absorbed inside there. So it's, it's in joules, right? Or potential, right? Plus, uh, now velocity uh, is, is, uh, uh, dr by dt, uh, again, I'm skipping the vectors here for now, for the argument's sake at this point. Uh, but it's a, it is indeed a vector. Uh, you know what, let me bring it back because I, I'll run into trouble if I just keep skipping it at this point. Okay, so uh, d, dr cross product with magnetic field. And magnetic field uh, is written as a... Uh, so just like the electric field is the gradient of our electric potential, is there a magnetic potential of which I can take effectively a gradient to get the magnetic field? Yeah. Right. So, the curl of, yeah. The, right. So there's uh, this quantity called the vector potential, right? And and uh, uh, again, I mean, if if. Uh, uh, if, if this does not ring a bell, that's okay. We are going to come back to it. But magnetic field can be written B as the curl of a vector potential, magnetic vector potential. So, and uh, 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 you can write the Q down here uh, for that. So this is uh, this is kind of an interesting relation. The way the reason I'm writing it in this way is is uh, the following. We'll see that. The you know uh, quantum transport problem in its full glory will be very analogous to this quantity. I mean the the result we are going to use for the wave function of electrons for all kinds of, will be very analogous to this this term, which is the Lorentz force. This is the completely classical. There's nothing quantum about it at this point, right? But you can see that uh, uh, okay. So there are two gradients here, gradient of space. So these are kind of d by drs, or you know derivative in space dr on this side you are finding the rate of change of momentum which is you know momentum p let's write it as px for for argument's sake and this as d by dx for argument's sake derivative of x so you are to find the rate of change in time of momentum you are you know you need a electric potential and a magnetic potential or a magnetic vector potential and you are, you know, the rate of change of momentum is related to the gradient in real space of these potentials in, in a certain way, in a certain non-trivial way, but, you know, in a certain way, right? So what we're going to see is uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, this is therefore a relation that gives you, you know, how does momentum change as a if you know, you know, the gradients in space, so d over dx, 
or in other words, it relates momentum to x. You know, and then that's something we uh, said that the phase space, uh, it may seem a little abstract now, but as you start applying it, it'll become you know, simpler. So you know, momentum px, we are finding rate of change of momentum, how fast we are moving in this direction. That depends on you know, gradients in this direction or gradients of x. You know. So when we are done with the quantum part, uh, uh, you can ask the reverse question as to how will the rate of change of x you know, what's the relation for the rate of change of x? And then that's the velocity of a particle, right? Instead of rate of change of momentum, which is the force, and ask, what's the rate of change of uh, uh, the velocity? Uh, sorry, rate of change of the location, dr by dt. You can ask that question. So uh, remember now that uh, we are talking about quantum mechanics. In classical mechanics, x and px can be completely precisely determined, right? In quantum mechanics, they are not precisely determined because the wave. And the end result of all that will be that the rate of change of, moment, uh, of, of space, or x, let's write it r instead of uh, space. So uh, that will look in a, in a very interestingly uh, uh, somewhat similar. You can kind of guess what it will be. You know? So you have flipped this to 1 over you know, wavelength. Wavelength has units of 1 over length, right? You flipped it upside down, so you're going to flip this upside down too. So it'll become a derivative of what? On the right side. Here it's d by dx. On the right side, it'll become d over d of momentum. You know, there will be a, you'll take a gradient with respect to momentum or with respect to k, because uh, you know they are from here. The momentum, uh, just to be clear, momentum. I forgot to write that is h over lambda, right? Which is also h bar times k, right? Momentum is h bar times k. That's also de Broglie relation, same thing with the two pi there. So what it will become is uh, the velocity will become a gradient of momentum of, and this is interesting. Uh, let me just write it this way. Here we had the potential, electric potential, gravitational potential, whatever be it. Here we have the energy of the particle as a function of the momentum. This is called the energy dispersion. If you're in a semiconductor, uh, this is the band structure of the semiconductor. If you are in, inside an atom, it's you know, whatever the energies of the you know, atoms are. So whatever is the spectrum of the energies allowed for the particle after all this quantum effect has been you know, taken place. So I'm, I'm just uh, um, trying to summarize this. We will land up here in the next couple of classes. Okay, so, so, yeah. But this is kind of a bigger you know, uh, overarching result in transport theory. So rate of change of lo you know, spatial location is the gradient of momentum uh, with respect to momentum of the energy dispersion of the particle. And you may have seen this if you have done solid state physics courses. It's called the group velocity. You know? Uh, you know, it's a slightly different form. If you write it, you know, gradient of momentum you are taking d over d h bar k of, sometimes this is written as e of k. So it's basically 1 over h bar d by dk of ek. It's the same thing, really. Right? But uh, so, th so, so this, is, this quantity is, is uh, similar to that quantity here. But uh, there is actually another term which uh, so this is, uh, uh, you know, the dependent only on the uh, on the on the band structure itself, but there's another term here which is analogous to the magnetic field term, you know, and this was uh, interestingly the second term. Uh, let me uh, write that down, and again by analogy, you can see that there'll be a d momentum over dt here, p over dt here, cross product, cross product with a gra gradient. But now there'll be a momentum here instead of r. Okay. Cross product with some quantity. I'm going to write it with a curly a here. It's not exactly. It's not the vector potential. And this quantity is called the Berry connection. And we are going to look at this in some detail later on in the course, not right away. Uh, this is some quantity that's determined by the band structure as well. It's kind of you know related to the band structure for a free electron, for a particle in a box. Most of them, for most of those cases, this is actually zero. You know? But in some you know interesting cases, it becomes non-zero, and this whole quantity 
is your rate of change of space or the velocity of a particle, if you might, you know, of a quantum mechanical particle. And uh, the re uh, so this quantity was uh, not recognized uh, till you know two or three decades ago, uh, till the uh, discovery of the quantum Hall effect. Only then, you know, this became uh, you know an important. Uh, you know, uh, for quantum transport of electrons in solids. This is what leads to, you know, if you want to understand a lot of the uh, topological insulators and, uh, you know, spin momentum locking and, and all kinds of uh, things like that. Th th this is the term where it comes from, you know, most of this just comes from. It used to be called as the anomalous velocity term because, you know, it was uh, not in initially understood. Uh, and uh, for most cases uh, in, say, semi you know, traditional semiconductors, this term is the the very connection term is zero, so you don't get this. But if you take a ferromagnetic semiconductor, for example, uh, just like for classical mechanics, this leads to a flow, you know, uh, flow of particles, um, not along the direction of the field, but kind of transverse to it. So this is transverse velocity. So when you are solving your assi assignment problem, uh, where you have a crossed electric and magnetic fields. Traditionally, an electron will move along the electric field or against it, I mean, depending on the charge, right? But if you put a magnetic field, you'll see it will move transverse to it. You know, that problem, you'll see that it, it's not going to move along the electric field, but, uh, you know, transverse to it. Right? And you'll get a certain velocity uh, associated with that. And, and this is a transverse velocity term. This is the longitudinal velocity term along the, along the force. It's okay. You can see it, you know, velocity cross product. You know, so it's a perpendicular. So, so this is a, you know, we have not really derived it. We just said that by analogy, uh, this is the quantum version of the Lorentz force, if you might. Right? So, so, and, and, and it, it, it uh, in fact, the way it's written, uh, you don't, you know, this is not even, uh, it's not necessary to have only electromagnetic forces. You can have any force you want on this. And, you know, this is a very general relation for transport of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of electrons in solids and all that. So, okay, so we'll come back to this, but I just want to kind of get this out of the way. Uh, in this, uh, you know, um, earlier in an earlier version of the course, we kind of reached here quite late in the course. I want to introduce it in the very beginning, uh, uh, especially this part of it. You know, th this is the gradient of the put electric, uh, the gradient of the band structure which is the groove velocity. This is something we're kind of well aware of, and, and I think you probably might have seen as well in the other courses. Okay, okay so now uh, let me uh, uh, move, move to uh, uh, just some, again, very simple ideas uh, to be able to quantify things. You know, uh, so if I uh, give a problem where you, you have to uh, solve for an electron moving in a certain you know, uh, situation, uh, how would I go about solving some of the problems? Okay, so first things first, because of the you know, wave particle duality here, uh, we know that a wave, a, a, a wave is you know, in x direction, let's say. I can say it's a wave if its uh, you know, amplitude is oscillating forever, from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, so it, it has to, you know, to have a complete wave uh, it, it must be oscillating forever. If I have a wave that's kind of only oscillating in a small part in space, then uh, I cannot ascribe to it a certain wavelength. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, uh, there's not a single wavelength for this. It's composed of many wavelengths. Uh, is that clear? So this thing here, if you're going from plus infinity to minus infinity, has a very well described wavelength, right? Right, very well described wavelength. So if I were to find out, say, in, in intensity space, how much strength is there as a function of, say, k, which is 2 pi over the wavelength, right? For this one, all the strength lies at its particular wavelength, lambda naught, right? So it's basically a very sharp function here. This is kind of the intensity or the power of, of the, uh, you know, as a function of k or wavelength. Right? All, all, all of it is one wavelength. The whole, all the energy of this wave is in one wavelength, or uh, one k, so I'm just being a little sloppy, two pi by the wavelength, right? Whereas this one, how will that look? Right? It must have a bunch of wavelengths. It cannot have just one, right? 
I must take a wavelength like that, maybe another one which is a little different, another one which is very different, and take certain coefficient A1 times that, A2 times that, A3 times that. I sum these all things over, and then I get this. This is the Fourier decomposition of any wave. It's called a wave packet, right? <coughs> and you can see that uh, for, so if I were to sketch it here, uh, it will look like, you know, maybe very long, uh, very strong in one, but then there'll be some more, some more, some more, and so on. So the intensity in, in the wave, in the case space, will be spread out too, right? It will be spread out. You can do it discrete, or you can do it, you know, continuous. I mean, I'm not trying to get into those details at this point, but, you know, it, it will be spread out. That is at least, you know, intuitively that much must be clear. And these are the values here are basically, if I were to kind of look at this, the values here will take a form of a collection of coefficients, you know, A1, A2, A3, and all that. These are just coefficients, right? They are the weights of each of these wave, wave vectors. You know? So that's it. Now, I can see that if my wavelength was, you know, inf if, if, if the wave was going forever, plus m minus infinity to plus infinite, infinity, then what is the you know, location of this wave? Where is it in x? Can I say that? Right? You can't say that. Location is completely indeterminate, right? So if the k is precise, right? If the k is precise, then I don't really know, you know there's no, no such thing as the wave is here. It's everywhere, right? The wave is everywhere. Therefore, I say if, if k is precise, uh, then delta k is equal to zero. I, I know it precisely, so there's no uncertainty. There's no, you know, randomness or variation to k, and that would imply that delta x, which is where is the particle, that's actually infinite. So I don't know exactly where it is. Uh, the un uncertainty of where that wave is, you know, where where it is, is really, uh, uh, I, I cannot describe any portion of the x-axis to this particle. You know. Similarly, here, if I say that I have created a wave packet such that. I want to describe the particle in a, say, 20 nanometers in space. Right? I want to prescribe a wavelength or a distance. Then clearly, here also, there is a spread, you know, right? Delta K is going to be, uh, you know, this, uh, this spread will be related to this delta X. And that is really uh, uh, this relation that delta X times delta K is, you know, let's say, this is typically, you know, for a Gaussian distribution, it's half, and for all other distributions, slightly more than more than that, right? So, so delta x times delta k, for our pra course, you know, we'll just say is of the order of one, you know, for, for 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 our purposes, at this point of the order of one, and then you uh, uh, multiply h bar on both sides, and you get that delta x times h bar times delta k is the momentum along the x direction, right? So, uh, sorry, it's greater than equal to, so greater than equal to h bar. You know? so, so that's the order of magnitude by which, uh, you know, the, uh, this is a measure of the uncertainty of, of, of a particle, uh, meaning if I locate the particle very precisely at any point in space, its momentum must spread out, or, in the other, or if I, uh, you know, let it spread out in space, the momentum gets more precisely defined. Right? So, so, so that's the, and, and that order of magnitude is h bar. And uh, I think you know that uh, h bar is, uh, again, you know, 10 to the power minus 34. Uh, uh, right, 10 to the power minus 34 joule second in order of magnitude, right? So, is that here? And, and, uh, you know, this is true for light waves as well as particle waves now, you know, where this is true for light waves. This is why, a, you know, laser will spread out a little bit if you, you know, make it go through a constriction and all that. If you restrict it this way, it spreads out the other way and all that. Similarly, for particle waves or electron waves, it's the same deal. You know? so, so it's the uh, h bar. Right? <coughs> Any questions here? Yeah. All right. So uh, now given this, uh, uh, let me um, let me just uh, um, gi uh, you know kind of uh, give an example of a situation where 
you know you might want to apply it uh, and <coughs> we can actually uh, start solving some problems uh, maybe maybe this is a maybe a hint towards the last problem of your assignment so uh, let's say i have a situation where i have an electron that uh, has a velocity of say v naught and it's moving in and and then uh, i have a it, it's moving into a region where it's a two dimensional problem so i have x and i have y okay so it moves into you shoot the electron into a uh, in, in some sort of a funnel you know okay let's say it's, it's looking something like this okay or a cone or whatever right right so these shaded regions are very high potential for the electron it can't go there uh, I, you know the electron can't go there and uh, you know, let's say there's a certain length of this region, and then there's an opening on the other side. It's kind of a collimator or something like that. You know, so you shoot an electron this way, and uh, so I can ask the question: uh, This is a you know kind of an interesting transport problem. Uh, what is the time it takes for the electron to go from here? To, you know, from here to there. You can ask that question. Right? Uh, so that's a prototype transport problem. So so the electron has to move through this region, and uh, uh, you know, uh, instead of some curve, you can have any curve you want. You know, let's say we have straight lines here for all I care at this point. Okay? So how will I go about solving this problem? So based on things that we discussed till now. We don't need some, any very advanced concepts or anything like that at this point. But uh, based on things that we have discussed till now, I have a constriction. Let's say I give you that you know, this is you know, B. And that's A, right? And then say, well, how does it say change, right? How, how will I go about solving the problem? I won't solve the problem, but I want to see how to solve the problem, right? How will I proceed? Let's say it enters with a velocity at this point V naught, right? So first question is, will the velocity change right? as it goes through? If it doesn't change, I'm done. You know, L over V naught, that's done, right? That's the time, right? But the question is, will the velocity change? And will, if, if it does, why will it change? Right? So, yeah? Uh, when we first want to find the potential, it describes that, um, that describes that region. And then find like, the yeah. state that describes the one time in that region. In that region, yeah. So that's a uh, good point. So you're saying that uh, just like we had you know, the potential for hydrogen atom or particle in a box find the find you know what's the nature of the potential here right so i'm making life much simpler for you at this point i'm saying that this potential wall is so high that the electron w cannot go there you know it's constricted it can only be in this region it cannot go there at all you know so i'm defining the potential for you at this point so yeah yep so this should be exactly then once it goes in, yeah. you're going to have some level of certainty about the position. So you could right. possibly know the next exactly. Right. Thank you. That's correct. So, so when it was here, you know, it, it could have any delta y. Right? It's delta y. It's y in the y direction. It, its wavelength could have been anything. Right? But the moment it enters here, you know, right, its delta y is fixed. Right, at any x, as it moves along here, is delta y is decreasing. Right? If delta y is decreasing, what can I say about delta momentum y along the y direction? Right? So it's going to change, right? And, and, and by using this and energy conservation, you should be able to solve this problem. So uh, let me just kind of outline it again. This is what you call as back of the envelope calculation, half mv square. Here, right, that's the initial energy. It will remain the same. So if you want to find the velocity at any point v of x in the x direction, so half mv of x squared plus, plus something, right? And what is, what is this extra energy? Where did it come from? It came from the fact that I'm confining it in the y direction, right? Therefore, it must have some momentum in the y direction, right? Because of delta y is finite. It must have a delta p y 
square by twice of mass. Right? But what is delta Py? Well, greater than or equal to h bar, right? So you just use it, and you can see that you know you can substitute this here. You know the delta y based on you know the geometry and all that, and you'll see that it 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 really goes as you know h bar over 2m delta y squared. So it actually slows down, and you can find out exactly how it slows down and all that stuff sort of thing, right? And I'm going to leave it here, but you can you know, basically what you do is take the velocity uh, because you can get an exact expression for it. You take it and integrate it from x equal to zero to x over l, and you get your time it takes. Right? So, so that's that's an example of how you might solve it. Right? Uh, it's not exact, but it comes reasonably close. You know? So so and you can uh, find out uh, how uh, uh, and then this maybe is one approach to the problem you have in the assignment. So maybe. Yeah. Yeah, John. Yeah. Just uh, a little confusion. If it's entering with a specific velocity, that means it has a definite momentum. Yeah. And therefore, it can't actually enter. It has to be spread out over space. Good question. So, um, in fact, you know, when when it's when a, if I have a beam of electrons, a certain fraction of it will be reflected back from this problem. Right? That is true. So those are other complications. I'm not getting into that at this point. Indeed, if I have a beam of electrons, there's a certain probability that it can even enter this place, and then because the rest of it is reflected. Uh, there's a probability that you know, if you have uh, you know, this velocity determines a wavelength in this direction, but you know, in the y direction, there's a spread of electrons. So that if you have wavelengths of, of uh, very long, or you know, then they cannot enter. If you have wavelengths very short, they can enter, and so on. So, so there's that, that aspect to it. Uh, I'm just trying to get some notions of uncertainty into this picture. Yeah. I mean, if you think of terms of like wave functions, can you just think of it like a water wave coming? Yeah, pre and pretty much. Reflecting the edges and stuff? Absolutely, yeah. So if you have a water wave, which, uh, so this is a two-dimensional problem. So it has a wavelength in that direction, and it has a wavelength in this direction too, right? And uh, you can think of it in many of those ways, right? But I just was trying to get to, uh, you to think that because the, uh, uh, of the electrons that are able to enter this, this is the situation. This is how much time it's going to take, and this is how you estimate it. Yeah. Yeah, so I have, uh, you know, the question is, uh, the way it's asked is there's only one electron here, right? So you remember you can have a lot of electrons here, it, it, you know, and there can be many states. There can be some states that will never be able to get into there because maybe their wavelength is much bigger than this size. Indeed. So the way it's formulated or is asking is, you know, uh, the, the lateral momentum is, is uh, you know, Meaning, at this point, the velocity is v naught. That's that's the idea. So yeah, yeah. So as delta y is being localized, yeah. the velocity increase as it goes through. You said it. Uh, right. So if you see here, right, as delta y is decreasing, this quantity is increasing. Therefore, this has to go down if we were to conserve the total energy. Right. What about in terms The product here, right? So, uh, right. So, delta y times delta p y will kind of remain of the order of h bar, right? And uh, you are saying will it increase or decrease the product? So, let me just say so you can actually completely track this if you solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, but. It won't be too wrong to assume. I mean, for order of magnitude estimate, it's very accurate enough to assume that this remains of the order of h bar. You won't go too wrong. You know, I mean, it will be reasonable. So, if you want to get an order of estimate, you know, magnitude estimate, this is a very reasonable way to solve the problem. Okay. We will develop all the process for solving it full blown using, you know, uh, time dependent Schrodinger and all that. But uh, at this point, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so this kind of hopefully gives you a sense that if I were to constrict 
the motion of a particle in space, then it, uh, you know, its wavelength starts shrinking, right? Uh, so maybe, well, let's say the shortest wavelength here would be kind of like that. Shortest wavelength here is like that. And therefore, this energy picks up, you know? This energy picks up and, and uh, starts fighting against the other. It's exactly the same thing as a particle in a box that if I uh, were in the ground state, you know, its wavelength is like that. And as you go up, you know, if, if the energy or the if you think of it classically as a kinetic energy of the particle that's rattling back and forth, you know, if it's the lowest energy, it has a long wavelength. And if, you, if, if it uh, wants to go to higher energies, it must have you know, shorter and shorter wavelengths. Now, this energy here is the y-directed energy, if you might, in this problem. OK, so, uh, uh, but this kind of summary here is, is you need to have many wavelengths uh, in order to describe a point particle. Uh, which you know is not quite a point, but it's spread out in space. And here's a manifestation with some mechanical you know transport properties of it. Okay, so I'll uh, move forward and and uh, uh, try to kind of uh, uh, get to a point where uh, we can uh, set uh, the mathematical preliminaries of the you know what we need in this course. So. Uh, so classical energy is, you know, kinetic and potential energy, uh, which uh, you know uh, lets us solve for, for uh, uh, in all kinds of classical mechanics problems. Uh, and what we are saying now is, uh, because of this wave-particle duality, I cannot have uh, the the uh, location. So uh, okay, so it's uh, kinetic energy p squared by twice mass plus potential energy V of R. So that's classical mechanics. And, and our problem at this point is that uh, we, we cannot have both you know, the momentum and the location precisely determined at any point you know, because of the wave particle duality. So I cannot use this relation for finding the energy of a particle anymore. Right? And that's the you know, central problem of quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, so, so how do I go about finding the energy now, right? And, and that was uh, the prescription that really, you know, Schrodinger and then Dirac and Heisenberg, they all gave in different ways. The Schrodinger version is uh, uh, the fact that, uh, um, you know, if I have a wave, first of all, uh, the particle is represented by a wave function. And here's an example of a wave function, e to the power i, you know, momentum x over h bar. Sometimes you can just write it e to the power i kx, same thing, right? Here's a wave function of a, of a particle. Uh, very similar to the wave function of light wave, for example, you know, e to the power i kx minus omega t for any in a wave. Very similar. And you can see it has the momentum and the location of the particle p and x combined together. It's, it's tied together now. It's not separate, right? So, so uh, the, the, the state of the system has both of them together. Um, and if, if the, you know that's that's the uh, wave function, um, I must do something to it to find the energy, the momentum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? And the way in quantum mechanics we get all this information out, uh, you know, how is the particle, how fast is the particle moving, uh, what is the momentum of the particle? Then you, what you do is take the wave function, and on it, you know, apply a momentum operator, you know, and it will give you if it is in a state of definite momentum, it will give you the value of the momentum. Is the operator, here's a number, you know, it will give you that. If it is not in a state of definite momentum, you will not get this equation. I mean, there will be, you know, you won't get it to be proportional to the wave function. You know. and, uh, and we'll do a few examples of it. So the momentum operator in one dimension is minus i h bar d by dx, right? That's the one dimensional momentum operator. If you are in three dimensions, Momentum operator is x. You can write it again as uh, minus i h bar y in you know, a del y plus z del z. Right? That's your full-blown momentum operator for three-dimensional di three problems. So this is what was used for the hydrogen atom by Schrodinger for the first time. So, okay. 
So, uh, all right. So this is uh, to find the momentum. And uh, if you find, you know, you can find the location. You can find all kinds of quantities, angular momentum, all that stuff from from the wave function. It has all that information in it, buried inside it. Right? So, uh, so each of them, uh, if you find to find the location of the particle, momentum of the particle, angular momentum of the particle, all that stuff, you know, you can apply this to the wave function and extract that information of the particle. Right? If I have one particle, you found what you need. If you have 10,000 particles, do this for each of them, sum them all, and you get the total angular momentum, total momentum, and all that stuff. You know? so, so that's the way uh, one would work with this uh, problem. Uh, but the energy, uh, uh, energy uh, requires, uh, you know, um, a little more, uh, and then that prescription was again given by Schrodinger himself. The energy of the particle uh, is is given by uh, again by complete analogy to to uh, classical mechanics here. Uh, the energy of the particle is written as you know the Hamiltonian, which is the momentum operator, not the momentum number anymore, but operator by twice mass plus the potential acting on the wave function. So, so that's your uh, H. So this operator here is Hamiltonian. will act on the wave function and will give you, if your state, if your state is in a state of, you know, if your electron is in a state of definite energy, it will give you that energy uh, or the eigenvalue. If it is in a, you know, in, in an eigenvalue situation, it will give you that energy. Uh, so you have to solve this equation to get the energy. You can't get it for free by just doing this now anymore that you could do in classical mechanics. No? You have to solve this equation to get the energy of the particle. Right? OK, so uh, I, I just want to just pause here for a moment. How many of you have not seen this in earlier courses? Just, you know, if you haven't, I want to kind of make sure that I'm not losing anybody. You know? So OK, all of you have seen it, right? And OK. So, uh, I'll, I'll start applying this. I think the best way to you know, get comfortable is apply to a few situations. Let's apply it to the free electron. You know, that's the prototype problem. We'll keep coming back to the free electron. Every problem we'll solve, you know, a difficult problem on transport or anything, we'll always try to find a way to take it to the free electron problem because the free electron problem is completely solved. It's exactly you know, solved and we understand it very well. Okay? So the free electron, what do I mean by the free electron? The free electron is just the situation when the potential is zero, right? So it's, 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 it's a flat potential. There's no change in the potential in space, right? It's a free electron. And for a free electron, uh, if I write my, uh, you know, let's just do it in one dimension. Okay? An electron that's moving in one dimension. Uh, and uh, what I want to, f what, what are the things I want to find? I want to find the wave function. I want to find the momentum, its location, energy, all that stuff. I want to find all these things about the free electron. Uh, I can find the current, the current that flows due to the electron, and all that stuff. Okay. So the free electron, uh, uh, the wave function for the free electron, how do I find it? You know, that's the first question. Right? You can always write it down from you know, intuition, but uh, uh, you can actually solve the Schrodinger equation to find the wave function. right? Uh, and the Schrodinger equation for free electron in one dimension is, you know, momentum operator is minus i h bar d by d x, uh, you know, but square of it over twice the mass of the electron plus potential, but that's zero, right? So psi is equal to e psi. So you've got to solve this equation now. E is a real number, you know, a real number. Uh, energy, right, is a real number. Okay, so. Uh, so that equation uh, basically becomes uh, minus h square over 2m, you know, d2 by dx squared of psi is e psi, right? Right. right? And and then this this equation as a solution, you can you know take this stuff to the right, you integrate it, and all that, and you get psi of x is some constant times e to the power i, you know, 2m e over h bar squared times x, right? In fact, you can have plus and minus 
when you take double derivative, you know, you get this, this plus and minus. And this quantity, 2m e over h bar squared, just from dimensional analysis, you can see it must be k, the wave vector. Okay. This is the wave vector of the electron now, right? This is how it depends on the energy of the electron. So, so what we are saying then is this is a e to the power i k x plus or minus, you know, where k is 2 m e over h bar square square root. And that immediately gives you also your energy. Flip it over and you get a, e is h square k square by twice mass. It's nice. That's the kinetic energy of the electron. And you know, it's not very surprising. It is you know, from de Broglie relation, you realize h bar k is the momentum. So it's just p square over twice mass. It behaves like a classical particle. It behaves like a classical particle, except it's completely quantum mechanical. It's, it's, you know, for this problem, the energy and everything merge, you know, quantum and classical merge you know, for this problem. OK, so to find the momentum, you can come in and apply the momentum operator on it, px. And you see that for plus ik, the, the momentum will be you know, uh, going to the right. h bar k momentum will be to the right. If you take e to the power minus ik, it will be you know, minus h bar k. So the momentum will be to the left. If the electron is going to the right or to the left. So. Okay. Very important point here is that allowed momenta are continuous. All momenta are allowed. Why? Because all wavelengths are allowed. The electron can have any wavelength. It is free to move from minus infinity to plus infinity. There's no restriction. There's no confinement. So it can have any wavelength. Therefore, it can have any k. It can have any energy. All energies are allowed you know, from 0 to infinity, effectively. Right? So, so it's a continuous distribution. Energy spectrum is continuous. This is the energy spectrum we were talking about, e as a function of k. Uh, or E as a function of P is the same thing. This is the energy st spectrum of the electron for a free electron. Okay, and, and for the free electron, you can see the energy spectrum. This is, you know, I can't emphasize it enough. This is a very important relation. It's a as simple as it is important. You know? So E of K is H square, you know, K square by twice of mass of the electron. It's just a simple parabola. That's the energy spectrum. And that's, you know, you can plug it in here. You can find the velocity and all that sort of thing uh, right away from, from this expression. It's called the group velocity. Okay, now. So I'll, uh, 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 you can show very interestingly that, uh, you know, that if, I, if I have a wave function that you know, I, I found that these are the allowed wave functions, I can actually take a wave function like this, a minus e to the power minus i k x. And that is also allowed state in quantum mechanics. You know, nothing saying that this is not allowed. Completely allowed state. It's a superposition of two states. One going to the right, the other going to the left. Right? It's, it's perfectly allowed state. Right? And you can find out, apply on this as an example from your intuition, if I apply a momentum operator on it, is it a momentum, is it a state of definite momentum? No, it's not because it has mixed up. You know, it has two momenta mixed up. So it will not give you a number if you apply, you know, the momentum operator on the wave function when it's written in a superposed state. It will not give you a number. It will not be proportional to that quantity. You know. So that means it's not a state of pure momentum or a definite momentum. Uh, so that's why it's not a definite uh, momentum. Okay. So uh, uh, let's see. We are. Um, um, what I wanted to uh, say, it kind of lead it to the next few things. If I take the free particle and I put it, confine it, put it on a ring or in a box or things like that, then we'll see right away that not all energies are allowed anymore. This is continuous. All energies are allowed. I put it in a ring, you'll see that only a discrete number of them are allowed now. Only a certain value, some of them are allowed. Again, because of the same exact same condition as the hydrogen atom where the electron has to fit and has to have a certain wavelength, integer number of wavelengths fit a circle, things like that. Exactly the same reason. So I can have a particle in a ring. You can find out the energies for that. Particle in a box. The particle in a box is a very important problem here in this course. And I will spend a little time on it in the next class. Because when, later on, when we do 
uh, you know, uh, quantum well transport or even things like superconductivity, this is a very important problem. It shows up everywhere, you know, so the particle in a box problem. Uh, and in a particle in a box, uh, again, uh, you know, by, by intuition you can, you know, by uncertainty relation itself, you can already write down what should be the energies and all that sort of thing here. But, you know, it, it's, it's kind of written down here. Uh, and for particle in a box, unlike complex wave functions, this is a complex wave function. It has imaginary part. Uh, in a particle in a box, it's real wave function. And uh, we'll see that when you have a real wave function, there's no net current. This cannot carry net current. You know? and, and you can see that if you are particle sitting inside a box, you can't be carrying current. I mean, the net current is zero. You're confined. In a ring, you can carry a current around. And we'll see later on, you know, when you see rings of you know, squids and you know, even in superconductors, it's the same deal. You can carry a current around a ring, but not in, in a box like this. So, so, uh, and when the wave function becomes real, see that the net current is zero, uh, uh, effectively because of that. Okay, so and then we'll look at briefly the harmonic oscillator because this will play a very important role, uh, uh, not just because you know the nature of the harmonic oscillator, but but because some of the mathematics we will develop for it, which is these raising, lowering operators, and and uh, uh, we'll use that a little later in the course. Uh, this you know, operator formalism for uh, looking at a uh, electrons, electron states and so on. And finally, the hydrogen atom, uh, which we did discuss a little bit. We don't need to know all the details of the hydrogen atom. It is obviously very detailed, uh, but it's a three-dimensional analog of the particle in a box 1D problem. It's a three-dimensional analog. But this was really the crowning glory of Schrodinger because how do you know that the Schrodinger equation is correct? Because when you put inside here the problem we started with today in the class, which is if you take the I don't know, I think I erased it, the Coulomb potential of a proton, okay, then this potential will be minus, you know, E squared by 4 pi epsilon r, right? And you solve it in all its glory, you know, P, use three-dimensional momentum and all that. The energy eigenvalue you get from here, it's a difficult mathematical problem, but you can, you know, this was solved and you get all these, you know, messy sort of looking energy eigenvalues. But when you find what is Ej minus En, and you find the number here, you know, how many, what is the wavelength of this 230 nanometer corresponding to light? This precisely matched the experimental observation of those you know, sp discrete spectra of hydrogen atoms. So that's how we know it's correct. Right? That this is the first explanation ever of the discrete spectrum of hydrogen atom by solving the mechanics problem or the transport problem of electrons in an atom. Right? So, so that's why we believe in it. Right? That's why we think it is correct. Uh, because it experimentally, uh, it proved, it, it explains something experimentally, and now it has been obviously used to design, you know, many things. You know, once you understand the underlying laws of motion uh, for electrons, you can use it now to design many th new things. Now, so, okay. So uh, we'll uh, let's end the class today here, and I'll continue from here in the next class. Uh, there was a question on office hours. I. Um,